Summer may be coming to a close, but not without some big fun and great music. Hello and welcome to this September edition of Local Image. I'm your host, Judy Skyvoss, and I'm at Lakewood Hills Park in White Bear Lake, where the biggest music event ever in this area is set to get underway. We'll find out what folks coming here had to look forward to in this year's lineup as we meet the organizer in just a bit. But first, let's get the buzz on a beekeeping couple in this Local Image segment. It started several years ago when I saw a documentary on bees. A third of what we eat today is dependent upon bees. So growing up on a dairy farm and not having a lot of farmland to work with, I'm like, well, what can we do with this beachfront? And um, bees seemed like a really good alternative. As we talked about it more and learned more about it and realized to do this isn't gonna be really, really hard. Um, and hopefully we can make a difference. Currently across the country and in Europe, there is a phenomena going on called Colony Collapse Disorder, CCD. And what happens is these mass producers of bees show up at their beehive one day, which might be 500 beehives, and they're all dead. They're not dead, they're gone, disappeared. So. Local producers here literally have semis, truckloads of bees that come in and help pollinate certain produce. And if we do not have the bees, we will not have the produce. And actually, almonds this year, they say, will be very expensive because they didn't get enough pollination. And in China, they have resulted to manually pollinating because of this. This colony collapse disorder, it's really three different things Here. that are causing it. One is um, pesticides that are systemic, that they use when they plant you know, seeds. The other is just dwindling food supply, less foliage. And then um, mites and other issues with bees. So it's, um, it's an issue. And one of the theories that they think might be the survival is local beekeepers. So we're hoping the farmers within the five miles that need pollination will get some impact from our bees. So last fall, we went to the uh, Arboretum at the, out in Chanhassen and took a class from Marla Spivak, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota. We went in there thinking there might be 20 or 30 people here. There was hundreds? 400, I think. It was sold out. It was the, this huge auditorium was plump full. Just learning about something that is amazing. I mean, these creatures, the, one of these hives to make two and a half pounds of honey have to fly the equivalent of three times around the earth, 90,000 miles. I mean, they are that busy doing their thing. What a precious gold. And that honey is the purest food that we have. It will never turn rancid. It can sit on a shelf forever. They can do things uh, in ways that are just unbelievable. They've got six legs. They've got eyes all over the place. They, they can smell, they've got like 170 some receptacles for the smell. Their GPS is just incredible. I mean, how they find home every night. If we moved one of those hives four feet in one direction or another, they wouldn't get home. It, they're that hardwired to find that. We really want to do it right. And we're such rookies <laughs> that <laughs> A little we don't want to hurt our bees <laughs> they say most people get into trouble because they overmanage the bees and if you just let the bees do their thing they're really really smart so we literally have checked them about oh, once yeah. a week yeah. uh, maybe a little more frequent uh, either just making sure they're okay adding more um, containers above them to make sure they have enough room that's been one of our big learnings this year. Because <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes we'll open them up and say, okay, so I think it looks good, but we're not sure. So a lot of times we'll kind of look at the books before we come down and figure out, all right, what are, what are we looking for? What are we trying to accomplish? And earlier this year we came down and it was clear even to us rookies that something was wrong with the second hive. And over the 4th of July week, roughly, we found out after the fact that one of the hives had swarmed. And what that means is that 
we didn't give them enough room to expand. They were growing fast and we didn't have a big enough house for them. And so a new queen bee came on the scene and marked several of the bees saying, you're coming with me. And um, they didn't leave another queen bee behind. So we had to take some from the other healthy hive and put in there to recover them. And up until about a week or two ago, we didn't even know if that worked because it takes a few weeks to know if these are old bees or new bees. And it's clear now that the second hive has survived, which is pretty neat. Some of the key, very elementary things we learned, um, as you can see, it says to ensure they have a good runway. So don't make sure there's nothing right. So I weed the weeds in front of there. So when you, in the morning, when they come out, it's like a race car. I mean, there's doom, 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 doom. So um, they need a ample water supply. So this was great. It's good to have good aeration. So again, this site is very nice because it's a lot of wind off the lake. The first hive has three supers. So there is the queen bee in there with brood, which means baby bees. So they have an average lifespan of 28 uh, days, is it? Uh, the worker bees, I think six weeks. Six weeks. So they're constantly dying and more brood. So the bottom three have brood and a queen in it. And the top two are for honey. We have beekeeping uh, uniforms, if you will, that we use. Um, some of the real um, professionals because? won't even use those. Uh, in fact, they won't even have gloves on their hands. And I'm sure at some point in life we will be that. We're not yet. Honey bees are just curious creatures. So they might buzz around, but they're really curious. Um, and they told us the greatest thing you can do is just remain calm. Don't, don't act hysterical. Don't go flying around with your hands. Fast movements. Just yeah. stay calm and let them be curious and they'll be fine. All of our neighbors have been nothing but supportive. In the city of White Bear Lake, bees were zoned to livestock. And so I needed to go change the city ordinance before we could get the bees. Everybody was very supportive and wonderful to make that happen. We'd love to get to a point where we have good production and can give away to friends. We've got a list a mile long of people that want that first jar. Our son um, and some of his work buddies have four beehives in Lake Elmo. And the lady I work with got two beehives in Stillwater. So I feel like I'm starting a trend. <laughs> Well, I'm not really a big fan of anything that can sting me. However, I do really appreciate those who take care of our bee population. So thank you for all that hard work with the bees. And I will note that our photographer, Scott Jensen, who's behind the camera, did get stung on his lip, but he is A-OK. -okay. And things are A-OK -okay here at Lakewood Hills Park where the White Bear Music Festival is about to get underway. And I have with me Adam Senarigi, who's the coordinator for the event. Welcome, Adam, to your Thank stage. You. This Thank is you. quite the stage setup you have. It's really extravagant. It is, uh, it is a large setup. Biggest one I think White Bear's seen. I think so. And this is the first time. First time. And why? Why are we doing this? Um, well, a little over a year ago, the Lions Club, uh, the White Bear Lions Club came to center stage and said, hey, uh, how do we put on a festival? How do we do a concert? And uh, initially they wanted the Doobie Brothers to come out. And uh, we kind of thought the city might have a problem with that, the neighbors might have a problem with that. So we said, let's, let's start small. So we started small and uh, it was supposed to be a one-nighter. And then um, they got the White Bear Area YMCA to uh, joined forces and they said well since the staging and the equipment and the vendors and everybody's already going to be here it's not going to be much more to do a second night so let's do a second night so we broke it up and did rock on friday country on saturday and you do this for a living obviously and you travel all around doing these kinds of productions but you're actually home right I'm tell home. us a little bit about yourself I'm adam well i uh born and raised in white bear grew up in white bear uh went to white bear high school and kind of have been here ever since. What's it so, like for you to be back home doing this work? Um, I like it. I enjoy it. I, I've, I know the, uh, the city pretty well, and it's nice to be able to you know, bring this in and, and get something this big for White Bear Lake. Right. 
Tell us a little bit about some of the, the headliners for the two-day festival. Uh, High and Mighty is opening the show, and then we've got Bad Girlfriends, and then uh, the headlining for the night would be the Dweebs, which is a, a band out of Wisconsin that does a lot of... They're all over the, all they're over the nation, fun. but they're mainly in the five-state area, and they're a very fun, yes. very fun uh, band. For the lineup on, on Saturday, we've got Maiden Dixie's opening the show up. We've got the Killer Hayseeds next in line, and then headlining is Tim Sigler. Awesome. So very all cool. three of them are, are big. Yeah, are absolutely. Big. And, of course, it's too late for folks to, to come out for this year's event, but mm -hmm. we want to give them a heads up because the hope is that this will be back bigger and better even next year. Absolutely. And so keep that on your calendar, right? That's right. At White Bear is a very, uh, we, we not only, it just all worked out for, for White Bear Lake because White Bear is known for its festivals and, and uh, you know, community job. events and things to do in the community. And you've got Market Fest, you've got the parade, we've got Manitou Days. Uh, the beach dance, you know, there's nothing been this big and there's been a lot of people that have said, well, let's do, let's do something like this. And we look forward to seeing you again here next year. Excellent, we do too. All right, have fun while you're back home, Adam. I <laughs> will, thanks. So now you have a sense of what this year's event was like, so be sure to get next year's Music Fest on your to-do calendar. Meanwhile, more great music is always on tap in the Twin Cities, and our friend and one of three owners of Bigwood Brewery in White Bear Lake has deep music roots of his own, including being a member of the Devon Worley Band, a country band that is getting a lot of good buzz lately. I joined Jason Medvick and the band's namesake, Devon Worley, inside Jason's home recording studio for this local image interview. Jason, it's always good to see you good again. To see you. And Devin, what a pleasure. It's great Hi. to finally meet you. It's nice to meet you too. Now, your band is getting so much buzz, and that's got to make you guys feel really good. But give us a little bit of um, background on how you got started in the first place and how the band came together. Well, um, I started singing in like little contests and things. I did a lot of the state fair, a lot of county fair singing contests or talent shows. And my dad's side of the family is a really close family friend whose son runs a guitar store. Corey, the guy who owned the store, hooked me up with another guy named Corey, Corey White. And he helped me write my first original song. I started singing and sitting in with his band, Jug, I was getting to the point where I was singing like two full sets with them and we decided that if I was going to keep doing this that it should be our own thing right. and we kind of broke off from that together and there's actually a couple of the guys still in the band now that were in Jug okay. with me, our bass player Adam and our drummer Lance. And then you bring this guy oh, yeah, into this the fold. <laughs> And uh, and <laughs> Jason, you have a, a long history in the music business yourself. Um, I love the fact that you toured with the Bay City Rollers back yeah. when you were, you know, just a teenager, like 18, 19. I was 18, yeah. How has it been for you having kind of been there yourself um, as a, a young teenager in the business to, to now being a part of this band? Well... The f very first time I came out to see the band was at the request of a friend of mine who's in the band now, Chris Thorson. And um, he asked me to come out and just, you know, check out the band and sit in. And my jaw dropped, literally. It hit the floor when I heard Devin sing and I heard the band. I was like, oh my God. I thought, I thought, you know, it's, it's a bar band, whatever. I was blown away. I was like, God, I'd. I think I'd really like to be in that band, you know? <laughs> I've um, I've always 
you know, kept an eye out for talent. And when I heard Devin sing, it was so obvious to me that she is, you know, she's an amazing, amazing singer, amazing talent, amazing songwriter. What do folks like Jason bring to you seeing that you are so young? I mean, you just are 16 now, right? So what does that mean to you? What has it meant to your band? Well, it's my favorite part about all of this is hearing the stories that Jason has from being on the road <laughs> at my age. Mm -hmm. Like, he's told me some crazy stories, and it's weird because he was only like a couple years older than right. I am when that started. And so it's always really interesting for me to hear all the guys' different stories and the things they've learned and all that stuff when they mm -hmm. were on the road because they all started pretty young. Right. I mean, right. you know, the one thing you can always tell though is when somebody's committed to it for life. And I knew that at an early age. So when I think I was like 13, 14 years old, when I was like, you know, this is all I ever want to do. I always want to have this as part of my life. And, you know, mute, that being music. Right and you can see it in Devon. You're traveling, I mean, you're on tour now mm -hmm. with your second album, right? Yep. Silver Creek. And so talk a little bit about what, what that means for you on a daily basis and your family and trying to, you know, get it all sorted out. Well, it's interesting because most of the time at least in the summer, we'll be gone at least Thursday, Friday, Saturday for a good part of the entire summer. Sometimes we'll be gone Wednesday, come back Sunday, mm -hmm. where it's so much fun that you forget how much time you're really investing in it. It just right. becomes part of your life and part of your routine. You go to school, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're from Plymouth? Yep. And so, you know, you have this other part of your life that is like any other kind of typical teenager. Have you found that hard to kind of balance? And Well, it's, it's a little weird, I guess. I mean, I go to a performing arts school in Minneapolis, right. and they're all really lenient on me being gone or missing some school. They're all really easygoing there. The teachers are really helpful about that stuff. You've had the awesome experience of opening for some incredible bands, especially this past summer, right? Tell us oh, yeah. about some of those. Oh my God, the most amazing show that I've ever seen was like two years ago, I think, two summers ago, when we opened for the Kentucky Headhunters. That was like unbelievable. We played with uh, Open for Joe Nichols, yeah. who currently has a number one hit on country radio right now. Right. Yeah, cool. right? We um, um, At the Taste of Minnesota. Moondance Jam, yeah, Moon Justin Dance. Moore, Rodney we Atkins. played for a lot of them. And then um, we did some stuff with Randy Hauser and Dustin Lynch. How fun. All the critics that I've read uh, on you have said, you know, watch out. In five years, you'll be headlining these festivals and everything like that. My goal is to keep doing what I'm doing on whatever scale that I can make it to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and something else that is really cool is you're nominated for how many awards with the Four, independent? Uh, well, five total, right? It's independent yeah. country. Independent Music country Music Association. Association awards. Why country? Why does that resonate for you so much? Well, there are so many different influences from that. Like when we go up to our cabin, I'm pretty sure for a solid five years. All we listened to was the redheaded stranger on repeat the entire week we were there. And my mom had a Dixie Chicks CD. It was either that or the, what Janet was it? Jackson. Janet Jackson CD. <laughs> and I would throw a fit if she played anything except the Dixie Chicks CD that we had. Yeah. It's just so much of my life has been surrounded by country music. Right. Where else can people find out more information about where you're going to be performing in the in the fall here? Well, you can go to our website, devinworley.com, and we've got all of our tour dates up there. We've got everything that we're going to be playing for like the next two years. Anything else that you guys want um, viewers to know who are maybe starting to learn of you for the very first time? What else would you like them to know? I guess if I could tell them anything, it's just that it's not what you think. <laughs> I mean, there. 
I'm always so impressed with the caliber of the musicians that I'm playing with on stage. They're all just so amazing with mm-hmm. so much experience. Uh, it's not a garage band. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> which it which is really it's a fun. Good time I mean, it's a great band. time. I think um, we have a great front person. Yeah. And oh, then we have <laughs> a lot of fun on stage, and that's. I think what makes the show, you know, absolutely. And and your band is also performing with the this year's Breathe Easy Music Fest coming up Mm -hmm. this fall. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. It's nice to get a little more insight into into you and the band. And uh, you know, folks need to go see you now before they're way in the back at the festival that you're headlining in uh, probably the very near future. So good luck, keep up the great work and have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Word has it, Devin caught the attention of the producers of American Idol. Devin couldn't say much more than that, but I'll just say that I'm going to be anxiously awaiting the final season of American Idol to begin, and I hope to get to root for one amazing young talent from Minnesota. Now, let's take a look at a segment captured last month during National Night Out, featuring a party in White Bear Lake where photographers Jeffrey Wilson and Jeff Melcock captured four generations of a crime-fighting family. Ellie Fredrickson enjoyed the company of her neighbors. Well, I've been here 10 years, and I love it here. During the Night to Unite event at Washington Square Apartments, an event designed to build neighborhood camaraderie and raise awareness of crime prevention, something the elderly have to watch out for. We have a security building that they pose as servicemen, like for Comcast or something like that and they come in and they, they want money, they demand money, cash, which Comcast never would do, you know. But what started as an evening with neighbors turned into a family affair. Well, originally we just planned to surprise Grandma and have dinner, and Mom had called her and said, hey, we're going to come over and have dinner, and she said, well, you can come over, but you can't bring any food because we're already having a party. Four generations joined together in the festivities. My grandmother, my two daughters, and my grandson. We have eaten, and we've had dessert. They had a trivia. A calm night for this skydiving grandma. I did that, yes, I did. Ellie made the jump 13 years ago when she was only 80. And for a while, I held the record as the oldest person over there to to skydive. Now she enjoys the company of family. I got a very good support system. On this night to unite. We love to share the fun and positive things happening in our communities, but sharing in the pain and sorrow is important as well. And the people of Mendota Heights suffered a terrible loss when police officer Scott Patrick was shot and killed during a routine traffic stop. Thousands of people attended his funeral and fellow officers and family shared moving tributes about the 47-year-old husband and father of two. We'd like to share another look at moments from that day in this local image segment. It's amazing. Um, Checking Facebook, everyone leaving their porch lights on, the memorial site, it truly shows how much respect Scott earned as a police officer and an all-around good human being. He was very proud to be a police officer, and he earned the badge he wore. As we head down the path of life, we don't know where it ends, but we do choose the route we take along the path. Scott impacted many people on the path of life, evidenced by the outpouring of community support over the past week. Scott's path led him to being a cop. He chose to walk a path fraught with danger. He chose to place himself in harm's way for others. And that's what sets each and every man and woman in uniform apart from the rest. Think about what Scott would would say about all this. Um, A hero's tribute to a man who made the uh, ultimate sacrifice. I can see him now if he was here. He'd put his arm around me and he'd have a smirk on his face and twinkle in his eye. He'd say, hey, not bad for a humble grad, huh, cadet? (laughs) 
And then I'd respond, obviously. I love you, man. Michelle, Aaron, and Amy, it's an honor and privilege for John and I to share a few words about your husband and father, our brother Scott Thomas Patrick. We are grieving with you, and we are here for you today and the days and weeks and months to follow. This kid from St. Paul's West Side, with the frequent smile, the low-key demeanor, the guy who could toss out witty one-line crackers, as my brother Mark has called them, They'd bring smiles, took the edge off of stressful situations. This big picture problem solver was living a lot of his dream. And then in an instant, he's gone. Lord, if you can hear me, I have something to say. If you're looking for yellow legal pads, Scott has them all. <laughs> if you find paper clips that were straightened and left all laying around the office, he did it. If you hear the sounds of constantly clicking pens, he's doing it. Please watch over Scott and do him one favor, because he sure as hell deserves it. Point him in the direction of the best restaurant in heaven with half-priced margaritas on Mondays. In love. Well, that does it for this September edition of Local Image, but don't forget we invite you to join us at the SCC Studios the week of September 15th for open house activities as we celebrate 30 years of community television here in the Northeast suburbs. Visit scctv.org for more details. And wish us luck because two of our On Location and GTN program segments have been nominated for Midwest Region Emmy Awards. You know, it's an honor just to be nominated, but we sure hope we can bring home the statues too. Until next month, I'm Judy Skyvoss, and I do thank you for watching Local Image.